please welcome Stephen Bauer. Michelle Pfeiffer. Brian De Palma. Al Pacino. So, why don't we start at the beginning, which would be with the person who discovered the idea of this film, and that would be Al Pacino. That's me. <laughs> Al, how did, how did you come to think of this? Well, I was on a rare occasion in those days, I was in uh, Los Angeles, and I, uh, I, I, we, there was a few of us, five or six of us walking up Sunset, and in those days there was a movie house called The Tiffany, and in it was a movie playing, directed by Howard Hawks, starring Paul Muni, and it was called Scarface. And I had heard about that film my entire life, I just was stunned by it. I was stunned by it. the story and completely taken by Paul Muni's performance. After I saw that, I thought, I, I just want to, I want to be him. You know, I want to be Paul Muni. I want to act like that. I want to try or something. And of course, it was a greatly directed film too. Howard Hawks was, and was Howard Hawks. And, and so afterward, uh, I called Martin Bregman. Now, Marty Bregman, who is, I've been in five movies with, you know, Martin Bregman, Dog Day Afternoon, Serpico, you know, uh, Carlito's Way, Sea of Love, it just is endless. And, and he's, he was my, my go-to partner. And uh, I just said, Marty, you ever hear of a, a movie called Scarface? And I don't remember what he said. I know he was in some dark apartment for some reason. <laughs> I could just feel it on the phone. I, I thought it was the apartment I had become familiar with. And uh, I said, are you all right? He said, yes, because he's three hours ahead. I was in LA. I said, I just saw this film, Scarface, with Paul Muni. Uh, can, can, can you find out more about it? Because I think it's a movie we should make. I think we can make it together. So he said Scarface and something and started looking into it. And that was all he needed because after he saw it, you know, he got people involved. And one of the first people that were in, was involved was uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone wrote this, you know. Uh, I wish he was here tonight. Uh, and uh, and that, was, uh, that was the start of it. And um, then we, we had Sidney Lumet for a while. Who, whose idea it was actually to uh, make it Cuban with the boat lift there in the 80s. He said, that was be Sydney. yeah, because in a way, Paul Muni's character was an immigrant right. from Italy. And this was, so it was that, 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 uh, that transaction. And uh, then things happened and that got separated. And then uh, the great Brian De Palma was taken on as a, <laughs> as, as a director. Amazing. So, and, and the rest followed. Uh, they had me, and they then got everybody else, uh, Michelle and Stephen and uh, Elizabeth and all the great actors in this, in this piece. Uh, just came and they just, and in those days we actually rehearsed, yeah. which was shocking. A lot. Was shocking, yeah. And of course, Stephen, I, I have to say this now while we're in this sort of chain, <laughs> you know, that, that it was, it was, uh, it was Stephen that really helped me a lot with the Cuban talk. And we, we spent how many months together? Because I'm really Cuban. That, that, yeah. That's what he said. He was really Cuban. Yeah, yeah. And when we and first got together, they finally put us together. And I go into this office and there he is waiting for me after all this buildup from the guys, from, from Bregman and from, and from Brian. And, uh, and, the, and we smile and we fall in love and everything. And, and, but, but Al goes, I, I just got to ask you something. Why is your name Steve Bauer? <laughs> if you're really Cuban, why are you Steve Bauer? <laughs> he said, it's my stage name. <laughs> said, no one can pronounce Echevarria. <laughs> Echevarria. Can you? Now I can. Now we See, can. You're always teaching me something. And but that's what he would do when we were together. We spent literally months together. Yeah, we spent I. months. 
Once. On the we, had, we had that luxury, though, didn't we? Yes, we did. Which I don't know. I don't know that people have that now. I don't do movies anymore. <laughs> but uh, those no, big it is movies. different. That it is different today. They don't have that. We had a couple of months to be together the whole summer, actually. All summer. We had all and, summer. Uh, and we took a. I lived in Malibu in a little hovel on on PCH, and then uh, Al took a, a house. He rented a house. A, beautiful house and I would come over every day for breakfast and then people would come by Johnny Carson and Marty Sheen and and uh, and all and all his great no Johnny Carson used to walk by my he house. used he to never walk came. by us no, he wouldn't go near me we no, never no. said hello no <laughs> he walked funny but Marty Sheen would come by so. Marty would come over yeah but we spent every day for just about a month just not reading the script yeah just talking about our lives is the secret. Yeah. That's how when people say, how do, you, how do you guys have that chemistry? Because we spent all that time talking about our lives in Cuba previous to the first shot. And what he taught me was that will imbue your performance. And so that was very easy and cool. And we did it every day for about a month. And then Brian had us actually gave us the luxury of doing rehearsals. Here's a question. You all have had children. And when you were making this movie, you might not have thought that someday you would have to say that you made a movie in which fuck is used 226 times or 1.32 fucks a minute. But who's counting? Uh, no, it got counted. The question is, uh, what did you tell your kids when they said, what, did, what is this movie, Scarface? What did you tell them? Well, in Society. those days, I would imagine that fuck was used a lot. <laughs> yeah, just but not, not in as movies. much as it Unlike today. Now. Just you know, not I, in movies. I think my, my kids did nothing about it when I, they saw it. They didn't even mention it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so that was not surprising somehow. I don't know. It's so, today's world. This is 35 years ago. So. But it was big enough, but it was, but, it was, but it was singular enough that the critic at the time, the Time Magazine critic, I remember, Richard Schickel, where are you? <laughs> Probably long gone. <laughs> anyway, he made a point of it. He counted, and that was part of his review, really. Why, why do you think it was used so much, I wonder? This is an interesting thought as to what, what was it put there to do? Was it to heighten uh, the, the already heightened vision of, of Brian's and, and uh, General Oliver's because I think that that was part of it. I think that, that bombast was part of what we were trying to say with the movie as, 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 as it was bigger than life, and, that it was and operatic and brilliant. So, so we come now to Brian. In the original... It had to come sooner or later, Brian. <laughs> In, in the original Scarface, when a character was killed, there was an X on the screen, was there not? You got an X rating. Yes. And you got it three times. That's correct. And then you changed it to, so it could get an R. No. And then you released the X rating. No, he just fooled them. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I would submit it to the ratings board. I had battled with the ratings board through a whole bunch of movies I had made. And this was our last skirmish. And I kept on submitting versions of it, and they say, it's an X. So I changed it a little bit, took a few more things out, and I submitted it a second time, it got an X. Then I submitted it a third time, and I think they were upset about the hits in The Clown. Remember The Clown, mm -hmm. the shot? <laughs> They're very bothered by the very, hits. Very, hits very, the very unpleasant. Very violent, it's just too much. So at which point, I said, I've had it with these people. I'm not taking anything more out. And I told Marty, and Marty said, well, we'll go to war with these people. And that's what we did. And... We're going to war. We're going to war. And to make sure that everybody understands that 
I, I, they said, okay, then you, we were going to go to war with the third version. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're going to put the movie exactly the way I originally cut it. If I got an X on the third, I got an X on the second, I got an X on the first, we're going with the original version. And they said, you can't do that. And I said, why not? And they, had, they didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> and ultimately, we had to appear. Marty organized a very good presentation in front of the whole uh, uh, board. And we won. It was the, one of the great moments that we had. We beat the, uh, the censor, board. censor board. So, Brian. Chekhov says if you see a gun in the first act, it gets fired in the second act. At the start of the film, you have a chainsaw. <laughs> There's nowhere you can go from there but more. Did you ever, th I mean, what was going on? Did you think, this is like very over the top. No, 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 that was in Oliver's script. That, that he had, you know, followed reporters in Florida. This was based on an incident yeah. of them, you know, chopping people up in chainsaws and dumping them in the garbage. So yes, I but said, they don't put this, they don't usually put this in the movies. Yeah, it was a first, sort of. <laughs> well, I kind of They don't liked... usually have over 200 fucks in a movie either, yeah. so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I thought you had to show that these were a different kind of gangsters. And uh, mm -hmm. so let's show in the beginning what kind of violence you're going to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I'm, I'm, as the father of a daughter, I'm concerned with body image, right? The preparation for this film, what did you weigh? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, you were... But I was playing a cocaine addict. To so, my point. Uh, yeah, so that was part of the physicality of the part, which you have to consider. Yeah. So, but I do remember, you know, the movie was only supposed to be, what, a three-month... For a month, it was. Shoot. It ended up being, and and, the, and then of, of course I tried to time it so that as the movie went on, I became thinner and thinner and more emaciated. The problem was the movie went six months. Eight months. It, I was starving by the end of it because the one scene, which was the end of the film, where I needed to be my thinnest. It was like it was next week, and then it was next week, and then it was next week. I literally had members of the crew bringing me bagels yes, I because they were all worried about me and how thin I was getting. I think I was living on tomato soup and can marbles. You can you remember your first meal after the shoot? No. It was probably Mexican food. <laughs> Probably chips and guacamole or yeah. something like that. At Lucy's El Adobe. <laughs> uh, Stephen, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, since you are Cuban, since you are Esteban Ernesto Echevarria Sampson by birth, and you came here when you were four years old and lived in Miami, how did the Cubans take to you playing this role? I didn't tell anybody, really, the extent of the mayhem that we would be a part of. But people knew, in a sense, they just didn't know that we were gonna depict what was actually going on in the city. There were, there were the murder, the, the body count in Miami at that time. And if you see that we were actually shooting while that was still going on. And a lot of the old school Cubans were concerned with me, and what I tried to convey to them was, relax, man, it's a movie, you know? So, <laughs> Just take it easy and be happy for me. Be <coughs> so, uh, Al, I, you Al, know, it's like, it's like as, as, as Stephen just said, this is a movie, but you were in another movie, which is bigger than all the other movies ever put together in the history of Godfather. time. Godfather. And you have lines in that movie that are memorable, and yet the line that is most memorable comes from this movie. What do you do when people come up to you and say, could you say that line for me? Well, say hello to my little friend, yes. <laughs> I say hello. Hello, <laughs> my little friend. That's an Oliver Stone. He's out there somewhere. I though. must say, <laughs> Oliver Stone wrote yeah. that, so as he did so many wonderful lines in this, in this movie, uh, you know, and um, 
No, it, it's, 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 it's caught on in such a way, and we all have experienced it. You know, th this wasn't the way it started, because when Scarf first, first came out, it was extremely controversial, you can imagine, this kind of movie. And it stays uh, in, our, uh, in our lexicon, in a way, and it's around, and it's a part of our culture, in a strange way. There's a good, very interesting book written about it called Scarface Nation as to some of the reasons uh, they think it is and they still come away not knowing why, why it is, why it's still here and why it still lives. Why language well, becomes iconic, why dialogue becomes iconic. And why this kind of spirit in a movie, why this kind of thrust in a movie stays uh, so somehow relevant, you know? Well, there's another line in the movie which could perhaps suggest this like for this year. Who put this thing together? Me. Me. Who do I trust? Me. Who does Me. that sound like? Oh, well, <laughs> I didn't think we'd get political. To, uh, let's see. Uh, George Washington? Okay. That comes to mind. <laughs> let's try an easier question for a, a hundred. Um, yeah. Who's more evil, Tony Montana in this movie or Satan in The Devil's Advocate? Well, we, we know it's Satan and the devil's advocate. And here's the reason, uh, because that's really the devil. Yes. You know, I wanted to say in that gunfight, because I think we'd, I wanted to say it because it's a very interesting story, that, you know, the gunfight at the end, uh, the, um, whatever you want to, the finale? The finale, yes. The this finale. is an opera. And... Uh, I remember firing off rounds and, and, and out, of, out of that machine gun. And I fired about 30 rounds. And somebody then shot me. And I got hit. And I flew in the air and landed. And, you know, I was still sort of alive and ready. <laughs> I, that was, there was a lot of support there, you know. A lot of that cocaine really uh, keeps you going. And so... There I was, and I grabbed the, uh, the barrel of the gun I just fired. Ouch. My hand stuck to it. Yeah. It just stuck to it. And so I, I, I remember oh, yeah. someone had to get me, you know, and then it was over. And we had to go to the hospital, a burn hospital, a great burn hospital. I got two hospital. weeks off. And then huh? so, Brian. You got two weeks off. The film but here's the thing. I was in the hospital and I'm standing there like, you know, and I got all this blood, this blood all over me, nurses coming back and forth. And I'm standing there like this with hold, holding my hand up and finally they wrap it up and stuff, you know. And this nurse comes up to me later and she says, well, you're Al Pacino, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, I am. She says, I thought you were some scumbag. <laughs> So, I mean, it, it, there's something there, you know. I mean, it's uh, interesting. So, Brian, a couple of questions. What did you do during the two weeks that the movie was off? We shot everything that Al was shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so you see those 8,000 <laughs> kids come in and try to shoot him. We shot everything away from Al. That's why there's so much shooting, because yeah. we just kept... And Shooting. Now, yeah. All those guys, also, all those little guys creeping up and, yeah. and fighting. I've have, I have read that Steven Spielberg took one shot on this movie. I looked really closely. I couldn't tell what it was. What was it? Oh, I don't know. Steven was on the set one day, and we had like four cameras running, and Steven was... The mirrors. He was? The mirrors. He was shooting one of the cameras, you know, because we used multiple cameras uh, when the kids ran in and shot toward us. Let's talk about themes for a moment. Oliver Stone wrote Scarface, and a few years later, he wrote Wall Street. To some degree, they're the same movie, are they not? They're movies about greed. Is that, do you think, what the movie is ultimately about? What's your sense of it? Well, I've always been interested in making movies about people that start rather humbly and then acquire a great deal of power and then ultimately isolate themselves and sort of live in their own world, could that be anything we're experiencing now? 
Comfort zone. So, Michelle. Comfort zone. There's a, 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 a remake of this movie that's been discussed. The Coens have done a, a script. It goes back and forth. Who knows? Could you see a remake of this film in which the Tony Montana character is female? No. No. I, th I think it's quite remarkable that the movie we made uh, is a remake of a really great movie. That's really hard to do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, Brian, if you were making the movie now, would you have Tony Montana be Russian? Would he be Mark Zuckerberg? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a very specific. You no, know, I, thought, I thought Oliver had a very fantastic idea, you know, making it with these Cubans coming to America. And I like, obviously, making gangster movies with, you know, gangsters that are Latin American. Because not only do you have the guns, you have the beautiful colors, and you also have the dancing. Uh, Michelle, uh, you've described your role in this movie as a set piece, right? You're the arm piece. You're the female person who gets acted on. But you've also said um, that owning and claiming your performance within that is important. What is it like to claim your performance against what Al is doing? Well, I get asked a lot, what did I learn from working with one of the greats, like Al Pacino? And I have to say, one of the things that hit me the strongest uh, from the beginning was um, watching him fiercely protect his character and really um, at all costs and without any sort of apology. And and I have always tried to emulate that. And I try to be polite about it. But I think that that's, um, I think that that's what really makes great acting, you know? And I think it's, um, and so I, I really tried to emulate his process. And, you know, the other thing about Elvira is that you know, because I remember at the time, even then, I kind of got a lot of questions about, well, you know, you're playing, you know, somebody who's subservient. What is what? What sort of message is that sending to women? And and um, I was also in my early twenties. I hadn't actually thought about that a lot at the time. But I mean, I really feel that sometimes you can do a lot more for a cause. By actually, I mean, being an artist, it's really presenting to people what is the truth. Yep. And not sugar-coated. And that I, I felt that by um, allowing people to observe who this character is and the sacrifices that she's made, um, um, said more than getting up on any soapbox and sort of, you know, you know preaching to people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so beautiful and so so, uh, it's so subtle. We have, we have time for one more question. I guess, Al, it goes to you. <laughs> so, yes. what did you take away from this movie? What did you learn about yourself as an actor, as a person, and uh, as a, a, a significant figure in the world? That's, a, that's, that, that's so, three questions. Okay, let me ask it an, another way. Oh, okay. You make a lot of movies, and sometimes you get a feeling that this, what you're doing, is really, really good. Did you have that feeling in this? Oh, I see what you're saying. I did have a feeling. I must say this, it's true. Because there are certain roles you feel that you can find that, that channel. We all have them. Sometimes they come a little more, a little less. But with Scarface, I must say, there was something about the preparation. There was something about the text and Brian working together with everybody that I found that, that channel in myself, that I felt this is about something that I really want to say in some way. And I think basically that's what we all yeah. feel. And sometimes we don't do it 
hear consciously, it comes unconsciously. But you, you feel you're, you're on some track. And, and uh, because it's, there's also roles you, you play that you go off the track. You know? But with Scarface, I felt consistent in a certain way about uh, something. Can I, can I just add that, that a lot of times you find yourself where the, the director, the, the, the captain of the ship has an agenda that is not necessarily yours. Or, or, the, or even the cast, they've got their own separate agenda. And to Brian's credit, what I've always felt through the years, watching the movie over and over again, and in the editing, of course, and he was there, he was, with, he was editing the movie, is that he had the wisdom and the innate feeling that the actors he chose to tell this story knew what the, they were doing. Right, Brian? And you let us go. You let us go. You let us fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but the amazing thing to me in seeing this movie again and again is the extraordinary performances. I mean, you just look at these actors. Hey, well, that's it. Well, so, but you let us fly. <laughs> Here we are, all these years later, still captivated. Let us thank these people. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all. Good to see you all. Thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs>